Well, <clears throat> I'm a little out of sorts today. Arrived at the church at 8.01. Found the staff fervently praying that I would show up. <clears throat> Wonder, wondering who was going to preach. So, All right. <clears throat> no small task today. We're going to talk about understanding God's wrath. I'm just going to let you remain seated as I read because it's a long passage, and then we will stand for the prayer. <clears throat> Starting in verse uh, 18, Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their heart to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also, the men abandoned the natural function of the women and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their errors. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Therefore, you have no excuse. Every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who pra judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Could we please stand together? Please pray for me as we contemplate this message. Lord, the reason why we go through a whole book like this is so that we don't get to just preach our hobby horse. Don't just preach what is pleasant, but we take the word of God, the whole word of God, without twisting it, without making it say what we wish it said, and look into the word of God. Father, I pray today for every heart, including my own, that we would see your holiness, 
that we would understand the wrath of God so that we might understand the cross and the redemption of God. Let the spirit of the fear of the Lord be poured out upon us that is so sadly lacking in this land. Yet it says that your delight, Jesus, was in the fear of the Lord. Wash us today. Wash our hearts, but really, Lord, wash our minds today that we might understand salvation more clearly. Lord, we will give you all the glory for every good thing that happens in this place. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for praying. Understanding God's wrath First, how can a loving God be angry? How can you say God, God, God is love if God is angry? And the answer to that is anger at injustices done to those we love is part of love. The cry of human beings today, really all over the world, for justice against sex slavery, the oppression of women, abortion, racism, and all of the economic abuses around the world are a small part of God's anger against sin and injustice wherever it exists. Jesus said this to those on his left in Matthew 25. Whatever you did to the least of these, you did to me. I took it personal. Paul was surprised when Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? Because in Paul's mind, he was persecuting Christians, not Jesus. But Jesus took it personal. Whatever is done to the least of these, is done to him, and whatever neglect happens to the least of these is neglecting him. Do not take God's seeming lack of intervention now as proof that he doesn't care. God does care deeply. Mark 9, 42, if anyone causes one of these little ones those who believe in me to stumble. It would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were drowned into, and they were thrown into the sea. God cares, and even though his intervention now may not seem what it should be, God cares, and there will be a reckoning for sin. He is especially angry when those he put in charge abuse their power. Listen to Luke 12, 46. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. The master of that servant, and in the context of Luke 12, it's the guy he put in charge. It's the servant he put in, put in charge. Put in charge of who? Put in charge of the church. Put in charge of the family. Put in charge of uh, the job. Those who are put in charge are not above those under their charge. They are still servants that will give an account one day. And when they get a sense of entitlement that I am in charge, therefore I can do whatever I want to do, they need to understand there is going to be a day of accounting because they are indeed a servant. So... Spotlight, one best picture. We watched it on our way back from Phoenix. It is, uh, if it's a powerful, powerful movie, it is definitely R-rated for a reason. This is not for your kids, but it is a very important 
movie for adults. It's about the abuse of Catholic priests of boys. But it's way more than about just what the, the priest, those specific priests that, that abused boys was. It was. It's about the cover-up. It's about that, that this wasn't just a failure of a few priests, actually many priests. It was a failure of a, an entire system that protected this from going on. When they knew it was happening, they, instead of removing those priests, they, they transferred them. And it's... It's a terrifying, fearful story. I felt every emotion. I cried. I was angry. One of the lines is in the movie was, it takes a community to raise a child. And we have found it also takes a community to abuse a child. There will be a day of reckoning a day where we stand before a holy God and give an account for our sins. So a husband comes home from work. He comes through the door, and even before he gets in the door, he hears screaming. He knows it's his wife. He comes in, he goes up to the bedroom, and there is a man that is trying to abuse her that is that is and she is fighting and clawing and and screaming if that husband is not angry don't tell me that he loves her anger is a part of love Part of our difficulty is we have seen human anger and we have seen so much sin in human anger that we can't reconcile anger with love. The Bible says in, in James 1.20 that the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. That's why anger in our hearts we need to Forgive. We need to leave room for the vengeance of God. It's not like nobody's angry. No, God is angry. But God is the only one that can bring justice. And we, we can't. And when we try to bring our own justice, bad things happen down here. So we bring our anger, our injustices to the cross where Jesus died. And we give justice over to the only one worthy of judging the human race. The anger of man does not work the righteousness of God, but the anger of God does work the righteousness of God perfectly. Point two. Everyone deserves God's wrath. Okay. Let's do another picture. Husband comes home unexpectedly. Gets in the door and he hears sounds, moans, groans, ecstasy. He opens the bedroom door and there is his wife in an adulterous relationship, a betrayal. Not just with another man, enjoying another man. What does the husband feel? Uh, like a thousand emotions all at once. Anger, yes. Sadness. Betrayal. Despair. Unfortunately, this is the picture of us. 
James 4, 4 and 5, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? God's anger toward human beings. We are all victims. We have all been abused, and he took it personally when you were hurt, when an injustice was done towards you. But you're not just a victim. You're also a perpetrator. And you have, maybe you haven't sinned in the same way towards other people. Maybe what was done to you seems in your mind very, very horrible. And what you do to others doesn't seem that bad. But that's not how God sees it. Every one of us deserves the wrath of God. You know, the great awakening, first great awakening in America is traced back to a sermon preached by Jonathan Edwards. This is in the 1700s. It's the most famous sermon in American history. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Well, people don't... And people that read it today, people that look at it today um, from our modern culture see that as just Puritanism and a time where we had ancient beliefs about God. No, 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 no. No, that's not what that was about. In fact, you can't even understand the sermon except in the context that he had just done a series on the love of God. And the people were completely unmoved by God's love for them. And then he preached in that context, sinners in the hands of an angry God. (laughs) You can't really understand personal salvation and your need to be saved until you see personal wrath that you, you deserve the wrath of God. You can't really understand the gospel until you understand that everyone deserves wrath. In Romans, the overarching theme of Romans, there is a deep division in the church between Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians. Both are looking down their nose at one another. And there is a, there's a schism in the church, Jew or Gentile, both thinking they're superior to the other. So what Paul does here is first he lists in Romans 1 the sins of the Gentiles. They are living in Rome. They have come out of Roman culture, which um, homosexuality had become very prevalent. Very, it wasn't even wrong. It wasn't seen as wrong. And so he, he talks about the sins of the Gentiles. And notice, Paul condemns the acts, the acts of men lying with men and women lying with women. I want you to know, if you are here today and you experience same-sex desire, That is not a sin that you experience that. That is simply a sign of brokenness. And I just encourage all of us. We're all broken, aren't we? We're all broken in different ways. But here's the key. Do not make your identity in your brokenness. Don't grab a hold of an identity that says, I am, this is who I am. We are in Christ, favored sons and daughters that are being redeemed, that are being healed in every way. That is where our identity is. You don't need to call yourself an alcoholic. You can say, I'm broken in this way, and I need to be very careful about alcohol, but who am I? I'm a favored son. I'm a favored daughter of God, and I'm being redeemed. (laughs) 
Identity is very important. The enemy wants your identity. Maybe you struggle with fear. Don't call yourself a fearful person. Don't see yourself that way. You are a favored son, a favored daughter, broken, but getting redeemed, coming out of our brokenness. The Jews have sinned in a different way. Romans 2, 3. When you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? 2.24, as it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Paul goes off on the Jews and he says, listen, Just because the older brother has sinned in a different way than the prodigal son does does not mean he hasn't sinned equally. This was, this was Jesus when he spoke to the Pharisees. They had only called sin outward things. And Jesus said, no, you guys, the law goes farther than you're taking it. If you lust for a woman in your heart, you've already committed adultery. If you hold bitterness and anger in your heart towards someone, you've already committed murder. Do not think on your high religious horse because you are so religious and keep all the rules outwardly that somehow you don't equally deserve the wrath of God. Because God sees the heart, not just the appearance. So Paul says the gospel is for both Jews and Gentiles because both have equally sinned. Both deserve the wrath of God. And then he says that the basis of God's wrath is the suppression of the truth of our sin and the truth of his redemption. Romans Five, eight, and nine. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? The basis of God's wrath being revealed is they suppress the truth in unrighteousness, suppress the truth both of their own sin but also of God's redemption. Judgment has to do not actually, God's God's wrath ultimately comes, interestingly enough, not because we are sinners, not because we live in darkness but because his light has come into that darkness to call us out of darkness. This is, this is John 3.19. This is the judgment. This is the point of judgment, that light came into darkness and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. It wasn't that they were in darkness. It was the suppression of light when light came in. Light comes in to save us. Jesus comes in to save us. God, seeing that we were hopelessly in sin, sent his son to die for our sins, to bear the wrath of God that, de- that we deserved, rested on Christ. He took all of the punishment for sin. And so that the basis of judgment Well, Jesus said it, that that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin in this, that they have not believed on me. The sin of the world is rejecting God's answer for sin, which is Jesus Christ. Point three, his revealed wrath now is our last chance. God's wrath is being revealed. How is God's wrath being revealed right now? How how do we see God's wrath in the world right now? This is a very, very important point. 
as we think about this world. Paul explains how God's wrath is being revealed right now. He says it twice. God gave them over to themselves. He gave them over to their own lusts. God's wrath today is not direct. He gives people over to their own wrath or to their own sin, to their own lust. He, he disciplines, he, he, he gives his love, he doesn't want that for him. There is a grace that keeps human beings, not just Christians, non-Christians, keeps them from experiencing the full consequences of sin. But when we say, no, 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 I'm going to do my own thing, the Father says, go ahead. That's how his wrath is being revealed right now. We see it so beautifully in the story of the prodigal son. When the prodigal is still at home, this is in Luke 15, when he is at home, when he's in the father's house, he is protected from the full vent of his desires and he's restless and he just wants to go do his own thing. But he's in the father's house and he's protected from all the consequences if he really got to do what he wanted to do. And then he, he says to the father, I, I have to go, I have to leave Give me what's mine. Give me my resources, my personality, my breath, everything that you've given me, and I want to do my own thing with it. And the father says, go. And he's given over. And he goes and he does what he wants to do. Pretty soon he runs out of money. And then he's, he's, he goes and he lives with the pigs. God's wrath revealed now is actually for the purpose of us recognizing because sin becomes more clear our need for him. It's actually a good thing to get caught now. He wants us all to come home When he gives us over to our own sin, it's because we insisted on it. Proverbs 19.3 says this, A person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. Isn't this a funny thing about human beings? We want to do our own thing. We want to go our own way. We don't want God telling us what to do. But we still hold God responsible when our life isn't going well. I am angry at God. How could God possibly love me when da, 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 da? Well, do you serve God? Do you love God? Are you even following God? Why is God responsible to protect you from all of the things the devil's trying to do in this world when you're not following God? And maybe all of those things are God crying out to you, come on home. Come on home. Entitlement is a horrible thing in the human heart where we feel like God owes us. And we no longer give thanks because God owes us better than this. His wrath revealed now. We need to be very, very careful what we call God's wrath. In the 1700s, Benjamin Franklin did all of these experiments on electricity. And he, as he is examining an electrical charge and how an electrical charge works, he sees that electricity is drawn to metal. And so he decides to do this experiment with a kite to find out because lightning, it looks like electricity. It's got the same properties as he sees an electrical charge. He's like, I wonder if lightning is electricity and if it's got the same properties. And so he does this experiment and sure enough, it, it's drawn to metal. It's drawn, it doesn't just go randomly, it comes towards metal and he invents something called the lightning rod. Amazing invention. It's still used today everywhere. To ground lightning, to direct lightning. 
Well, the clergy of the day were against the lightning rod, and here's why. They felt like he was playing God. If God wants to destroy somebody, if God wants to burn down a house, if God wants to burn up a ship, who are we to intervene? And here's Benjamin Franklin's response. Then why put a roof on your house to keep you from hail or from rain? We live in a world where there is natural laws set up, and these are not to be seen as direct judgments. Granted, as a result of original sin, there is a curse on this earth, and things are not how they were originally intended to be. But Jesus said in Luke 13 to see, he said there there was a tower that had fallen probably because of an earthquake and 18 people died. And Jesus said to his disciples, I know what you guys are thinking. You're thinking that somehow those were worse people than you are and that that was somehow God's direct judgment. He says, that's not how it is. But unless you repent, you too will perish. They're not worse than you. And the idea that God's wrath is like pointing out people today, that is absolutely not how it works. God's wrath revealed now is simply God giving people over. People that were protected end up being unprotected in a world where, well, we all know it, lots of bad things are happening because of original sin. The reason why I call his revealed wrath now is our last chance. Is the reason why we're even still here. Because they were complaining. Where's the promise of his coming? Why isn't he coming? He said he was going to come. Where is he? Things have gone on since the beginning. And Peter says, "Um, God's not slow concerning his promise. His promise is still good. But God is patient. He doesn't want anybody to be lost. He wants everybody to repent and come to the knowledge of the truth. Do not take the slowness of God's promise is that he doesn't care. He cares so much that he's waiting. And Paul says, God is patient. He is tolerant. He is kind. But it's all meant to lead us to a place of repentance. Final point, stored wrath. A look into hell. Romans 2, 5. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. So here's the three things that we learn about hell from this text. Number one. Listen to the words. You are storing up wrath for yourself. Huh? I thought God was storing up wrath to pour up. No, 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 that is not how it is. In God's mind, from God's viewpoint, he's already poured his wrath out for you and for me on his son, Jesus Christ. He has borne our sin. He has taken our sin. There is no need for you and me to ever experience the severity of God. God has expressed his kindness and his love to the human race in Christ by fulfilling his holy demand against sin. Jesus shed blood for you and me. So in God's perspective, you are actually storing up wrath for yourself by resisting his kindness and his goodness and his patience and your unwillingness to repent, your stubbornness to go your own way. I'm going to do my own thing. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. You are actually storing your own wrath up for yourself. God's not storing it up for you. You're storing it up for yourself. On that day, C.S. Lewis says this. Christ will look at you with a tear in his eye and say, your will be done. We refuse to say to God, your will be done. 
And so one day he will say to us, your will be done. C.S. Lewis said there are some people that would rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. The second thing that we learn is that those who have rejected God's love will suffer conscious torment beyond what we can imagine. There is a place of punishment for sins that is described by Jesus, by John, as a place of conscious torment. I don't like this, Pastor Tom. I do not like this. Not one bit. Let me tell you why it's so important for us to think about this. Everybody likes heaven, right? Everybody likes heaven. Everybody likes the promise of heaven, the promise of seeing loved ones in another life, uh, the, the purpose that it's not just about this life, that there, this is actually a, a warm-up. This is the hors d'oeuvres for eternal life in the place of great beauty where there's no suffering or pain or crying. And we all want that promise. And Jesus said, it's true. He said, if it was, there are many mansions in my father's house. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. I'm not telling you what you want to believe. I'm telling you it's true. And it's true. There's a heaven to gain. But it's interesting that Jesus spoke about hell more than he spoke about heaven. Not as a threat to his enemies, but as a warning to his friends. Why did he talk so much about hell? Because if we consider it, if we take a look into hell of why it's there and what happens there, it can prevent us from going there. As Jesus looks over this congregation this morning, he doesn't want one of us to go to hell. He died so that all of us could be saved. It is very important to have the courage to look at something unpleasant. The Bible says in the last days, men will surround themselves with, with, they'll have itching ears and they'll surround themselves with teachers that will tell them just what they want to hear. We are, by the grace of God, trying to be faithful to the word of God and to tell us what's true, not just what we want to hear. Hell is a place of conscious torment. There are two places. One is Hades. And that is a place where the soul and the spirit are tormented but not consumed. Hades is now. It is a holding tank right now. It is not hell. It is, hell and the lake of fire are synonyms. Hades is a holding tank right now where punishment has already begun. Hades holds spirits and souls. Death holds bodies. At the final judgment, um, Everybody receives back. Death gives up its bodies and Hades gives up its souls and everybody gets their body back for final judgment. The Bible actually says that Hades and death are both thrown into the lake of fire as well as whoever's names are not written in the book of life. So what is hell? What is hell? the lake of fire. We know that it is a place of conscious torment. There are two evangelical options for the nature of hell. There are two councils, evangelical councils, one in America in 1988, one in Britain in 1995. And in both councils, the same conclusion came, and, and the conclusions were two. One, that universalism, the idea that hell is remedial, the idea that somehow everybody in the very end will be saved, because God, God so loves people that God eventually will bring everybody back, and that even the devil himself will be saved. Um, both councils ruled that universalism is heresy, and 
If you read the New Testament, you, you see that the whole tenor of the New Testament is that there is eternal life and there is eternal punishment. There is, this punishment is irreversible. It, it is a punishment that lasts forever. However, the nature of that punishment, there are two positions that are both evangelical positions. It's very interesting because for the first three centuries of the church, there was no ruling on the nature of hell's punishment. It didn't come until the fourth century. And so there are two positions today. One is that hell is a place of eternal torment. One is is that hell is a place where we are judged for our sins against humanity, and after those sins have been judged, that the soul is annihilated. Now, if you've been around here for long, you know that my position is the second position. I have written a book on it called Raising Hell. There's a CD out there called Let's Talk About Hell. And uh, we have, but it's not the official position of City Church. City Church, simply, we believe in hell. We believe there is a hell, there's a heaven, there's a hell, and that hell is a place of God's righteous judgment. We do not have a, you don't have to be this position or that position. In fact, we have a disagreement among our pastoral staff. We agree to disagree on the nature of hell. We have a disagreement on the elder board as to the the nature of hell. We agree to disagree. So why am I bringing this up. This is actually one of the main, one of the main themes of the book of Romans is to be able to agree to disagree on non-essentials. This goes throughout the book. Romans 14 is entirely dedicated to things that we have convictions about that if we hold them in the wrong way, we're going to divide the church. The Bible says, or not the Bible, the early fathers said, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. So you are absolutely welcome to disagree with me on my conclusions about hell. You're welcome to be at this church and know that you've got some people that see it differently than I do. <clears throat> so, but since I'm the pastor, I get to tell you why I believe what I believe about this. <laughs> I believed in eternal torment for many, many, many years of my ministry. Here's, here's the bottom line. To understand my position. I believe that we were created for eternal life. I do not believe we were created with eternal life. Adam and Eve were made in the image of God, and it's very easy to make a jump that therefore they're eternal like God is eternal. They are made in the image of God, and they were created with the capacity for eternal life. And he put a tree in the garden called the tree of life that if they would eat of that tree, they would share eternal life with God. And when they chose to eat of the other tree, angels were put at the garden so that they couldn't get back in. And the reason given, Genesis 3.22, was lest they eat of the tree of life and live forever apart from me. I don't, I don't believe that Human beings are inherently immortal. And you you can read in the book and in the CDs that the arguments for eternal torment start with, not the the Old Testament, starts with Plato, that men are immortal, that souls are immortal, that souls are inherently immortal. And they quote Greek philosophy, not the Bible. I believe God gives a different picture of Mankind. Man is like the f- flower that fades and the grass that withers. And that without eternal life given to us, we will perish. We were created for 
eternal life. God came, Jesus came to give us eternal life. Those who reject Christ will have their bodies and their souls ultimately destroyed in hell. Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Narrow is the path of life. Wide is the road that leads to destruction. Secondly, those who reject Christ will have had bodies that died physically once but are retrieved for the final judgment and then cast into the lake of fire, which is called the second death, Revelation 20, 14 and 15. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death the lake of fire, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. We all die once. And of course, non-Christians, atheists, want that to be it. They don't want to live past the body. We only go around once. We're, We're just like the animals. No, that is not true. There is. You will live past your life. You will live for a judgment day. Everyone will. And you will get back your body. But the second time around, both body and soul will be destroyed in hell. Number three, those who reject Christ will perish like the beasts who they became like, rejecting the image of God. 2 Peter 2.12. Peter says, like animals, they too will perish. If you don't have in your mind that human beings are eternal, and you just take it on face value, think of the golden text of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Those who have eternal life will live forever. Those who don't will ultimately perish. To believe believe in eternal torment, you have to believe that that new body they get is imperishable. We are raised imperishable. That's what it says. At the twinkling of an eye, at the, at the last shout, we join God and we have imperishable bodies. To believe in eternal torment, you have to believe that their new bodies are also imperishable, which is fine to believe that. And a lot of the church, most of the church believes that. But just so we all understand, Jesus said we would, the wicked would perish. Paul said they would perish. Peter said they would perish. And John said they would perish. John said... This world and all of its desires are passing away, but those who do the will of God will abide forever. And then finally, those who reject Christ will ultimately be consumed by eternal fire. Matthew 3.12, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. This is Messiah. And he will gather his wheat into the barn. That's us. And he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The fire is eternal. The punishment is eternal in the sense that it's irreversible. But it ends after they have been rightly and justly punished for all the sins against humanity. The penalty for rejecting God is to ultimately be consumed in the lake of fire. Hebrews 10, 27 but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. All right, we're almost done. Everybody say praise God for that. In Matthew 25, Jesus says to those on his right, Come into the kingdom that was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. There is a kingdom of God 
There is a heaven that has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This is the plan of God. It is why Jesus died. Do you know what he has to say to those on his left? He has to say, go to a place that was prepared for Satan and his angels. Hell wasn't made for man. There was not a place in hell prepared for you. It was prepared for Satan and his angels. God wants you and me to be saved. Could we have every head bowed, every eye closed for just a moment? Two, two groups of people that I want to pray for. The first one is this. You are able to own today that you deserve the wrath of God. That you are not just an innocent victim in this life and everybody else is a bad sinner. But you are part of the problem. That you have sinned against God and against your brothers and sisters. And owning that, you see that you need the mercy of God. Well, here's the good news. God loves you. This is actually the day of salvation. He's extending his hand right now. He is inviting you to repent, which simply means to turn around. Stop going your own way, living for yourself. Turn around and ask God, Jesus, to come into your life, the Holy Spirit to come into your life and start living your life with God, in God instead of apart from him. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, no matter what they've done, no matter how bad they've been, no matter what they believe, if anyone opens the door, I will come in. And so my invitation is this, not have you been persuaded by my speech, but is God knocking on your door? Is God trying to get your attention and saying, I love you. I died for you. Open up your heart. If that is you, with every head bowed, because it's between you and God, but I do want to pray for you. I want to help you open the door. With every head bowed, if that is you, would you just raise your hand real high right now, long enough for me to see it? Okay, I got you. God bless you. I got you in the back there. I got you over here. God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. You can put those hands down. Anybody else? I'm looking up into the balcony now. Anybody else? By our raised hand. We're going we're gonna to pray in just a moment. If I missed your hand, God didn't. Would you just slip your hand over your heart right now if you raised it and let's pray. Lord, thank you. You are a perfect being. It's very, very hard for us to grasp that. All of the junk and evil that goes on in this world is not because you're not holy or because you don't care. Your lack of intervention, your answer to that is, I have intervened. I went to the cross and died. If I, if I was just to remove all evil, I'd have to remove every one of you. But I don't want to. I want to invite you into my kingdom, into my family. So Jesus, we're just opening our hearts right now. We're opening that door, God, by faith right now. Lord, come in. Save me. I receive your gift of eternal life. It's funny because they needed to eat of the tree of life. Do you know there's a new tree of life? It's called the cross. Hallelujah. Lord, we, we eat of the cross. Of the fruit of the cross which is eternal life. The Father's command, it says in John 12, is eternal life. We receive now your gracious gift. Forgive us for our sins. We repent for going our own way, doing our own thing, and making our identity in sin and weakness instead of in you. Save us, we pray in Jesus' name.
we stand to our feet together. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, we've got a booklet at our Welcome Center that will help you to grow. It's called The New Life, and it's our gift to you. Please stop by and get that. You could also get them up front. If the ministry teams come up here and you want to get prayed for, we've got those books in in these plastic containers as well. Here's the second call. The Bible says that Jesus' delight, this is Isaiah 11, was in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord drives out every other fear. It drives out the fear of people. It drives out the fear of the economy. It drives the fear of failure. When we experience the fear of the Lord, and it can be simply defined as this, living for an audience of one. And if you want the fear of the Lord, it says, by, have you had trouble departing from evil? The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 6, it's by the fear of the Lord that a man departs from evil. You talk about a way to be empowered to walk in holiness. Let the Holy Spirit bring this dimension. So if you want more of the fear of the Lord, the right fear of the Lord, just open your arms in the received position. I certainly have mine open. Lord, our human tendency is to run away from thoughts of punishment and anger and we just want it to be warm and fuzzy. Lord, we don't want to deceive ourselves in this place. We've got come as you are on our sign for people, but in this sanctuary, we say to you, come as you are. We don't want to make you in our own image. And so, Lord, give us a right fear of God. For those of us, Lord, who have been in your house, but have just been kind of playing around and just kind of playing with sin and excusing it, Lord, get that off of us right now, I pray in Jesus' name. Get us way in the house, God. Get the thoughts of going back to the world out of our mind and out of our hearts. We want to be with you now and for all eternity. Grant the fear of the Lord. And Father, together we ask for our culture that has in many ways not just said sin is okay, but has encouraged others. Come on, go. Sin. Sin greatly. It's okay. A loving God understands, go ahead. Or there is no God. We've, we evolved. There's no difference between you and an earthworm. You're just made up of desires that need to be fulfilled. God, wash our minds and our hearts from this culture, we pray. God, we love you in Jesus' name. We're going to have uh, ministry teams up here. Um, God bless you. Have a great week. If you want more prayer, come on up. If you want to stay and worship, we're going we're gonna to be worshiping for a little while as well. God bless you.